Hello, my name is Strasser. I am a junior from My name is Megan and I'm a junior at Madison West High School. Hello, my name is Brandon and I'm a uh, sophomore at West High School. My name is Mary and Jalice and I'm a Afternoon, Mr. Gothard. My name is Zijan, and I'm a sophomore from Madison West High School. I'm a freshman from the Phillips Memorial. Taria, you have a freshman from Capital High. My name is Jay. I'm a junior from East. My name is Ariana, and I'm a junior from East High School. My name is Ruby, and I'm a freshman from the Phillips Memorial. Yeah. It's cool. There were a student for the overdose and talk nice and educational setting as superintendent. It is important to have a desire to persist in Listen of students and learn from their experiences. Providing safe of how viewers have engaged with students face to face in the past to ensure that the student force is properly represented in respect of a diverse student population. How are you going to directly inform students? And important discusses and decisions. Great. Well, first of all, students, uh, thank you. It's great to meet all of you, and thank you so much for participating today. And Trevor, so fitting that the first question comes from the file answer and graduate from the file. So um, here's your answer. So last year, like many school districts, we faced a lot of community and school violence. And it got to a point where I understood that I could gather a lot of information from surveys or anecdotes from what I heard. But I thought to myself, I need to spend time with students. And I don't mean showing them to school or colleagues or going into a few classrooms. I mean really engage with students. So in the district I work in, we organized a series of student convenings called Power of the Children. And we bust students in for eight full days from around the district to a community center. And I spent the entire day with students in small groups, about 250 students. Some schools had a, um, a little bit less, but they were large groups and broken into grade levels. And we did some work together and we broke into small groups and came back in the afternoon and solved all the world's problems. But what I learned from these meetings very quickly is that you all, students, have a very different definition of safety than sometimes adults do. And it was key to me to hear that the concerns that you had maybe weren't quite related to some of the headline issues that the community was facing, that it was more some of the day-to-day -day things that you experienced in your, in your school days. One of the things in particular in our district that we were struggling with is transportation. We had to get away from some of our yellow buses, 270 at one time, and make a change to use our city bus routes for our high school students during the pandemic. That was a really hard shift. These are not routes that are set up for schools. They're set up for the community to, to use metro transportation. And students are pretty adamant with me that this was not uh, their desired way of, of getting to school for a number of reasons, from safety to knowing that I can get on the city bus. I don't really have to get there in the morning. I can take the next bus and getting there you know, later in the day. These are things that had really occurred to me when we had to make that decision. I made the decision following this, these convenings, to, to go back to our team and say, I need you to trip, uh, work with our transportation vendors and find a way to get us additional bus routes, find us a way to get additional drivers, and was willing to invest significant dollars to make sure that we got back to yellow buses. 
Uh, this year, following winter break, we had our last high school who had been removed from yellow buses, returned to yellow buses. So that probably wouldn't have happened at least you know, right now, by January of 2024, had it not been for the opportunity that I had to spend you know, those days with our students. And it was consistent to mark them uh, that this was the preferred way for them to get to school. I will say that we've been able to hire and keep the routes you know, going, and, and it's been really well received uh, by our community. Thank you. All right. Madison has uh, one of the largest achievement gaps in the state um, and has for like decades now. Um, and that's something that I think a lot of people here can also attest to. Um, in order to like fix this, uh, systemic change is needed. Can you share a specific example of an action you undertook or some policy you implemented uh, in order to help uh, narrow achievement gaps in high schools? Brenda, thank you for the question. You're right. These have been historically underserved students have been suffering in the way that we do school. We can we know that for just about any measure that we can take in the disproportionality, uh, whether it's race, whether it's um, students that receive specialized services, EL students, all uh, many times receive outcomes that are that are uh, you know, that are far different from their peers. And I think as a school district, this has been a call to action at MSD for a problem long time and it has in districts around the country. So one of the things that I'd like to share is that I had the decision to make in our current district about how long do we allow students to fail? And let me share with you what I mean by that. There was a point of time when the students in high school earning credit and maybe struggling for a lot of reasons, and we don't have time to get into all those reasons today, whether it's attendance or mental health or trauma or Many of the things that, that students really come, you know, filled their backpacks filled with these needs many times to, to start the day. And I don't think it's okay for a student to get to week three, week four of a new grading term and realize there's no hope. And I believe that there's a way for us to begin credit recovery opportunities right away, early when a student is struggling, when a student is off track to help a student get back on track. And I think of one thing we learned during the pandemic, it was that. You know, we can have asynchronous or synchronous learning opportunities. They might not be preferred, might not be the best, but it's a way to help students stay engaged because the achievement gap only gets worse if a student who's not engaged doesn't have the ability to be picked back up. The other ways is that a number of students, again, the system is set up, so if you fail a course, you go to summer school to repeat the same course, except where there's less support. That doesn't, to me, sound like a way of keeping high expectations for a young person's learning to help he, she, or they get back on track. So I think it's important as well to find relevant course offerings that can be offered in the summer, perhaps an experiential class. We had a class this last summer that was welding, but it was also co-taught with a math teacher. So students are able to do something hands-on, something with a career exploration that also is a math credit that they may have missed during the school year. Uh, the results of that are great, and I, we saw a very high completion rate of students in experiential learning, and it has made a difference for uh, Black students in particular in terms of graduation rates, because again, um, we are not allowing students to fail further. Um, and I think it's something that we have to be committed to, uh, to make decisions. Um, that are with good time to make sure we're not allowing students get lost in our in their schools, in their community, and lose hope altogether. Question for each student. Sorry. In order to build effective representation coalition in Madison, the next superintendent would have to bridge many racial, cultural, lingual and economic divides in order to be successful. Please share how you would have approached multiple and build a coalition to achieve positive outcomes for all students. I think for me it starts with growing up in the east side of Madison with a black father, white mother. Uh, this is something I was born with. 
born and how to navigate dynamics of difference. Uh, born with the um, perhaps the inability at times to understand who I was and how I represented myself and represented in my community. Um, I now lead the most diverse school district in the state of Minnesota. And I'm very proud of that. And with sometimes the challenges of difference, I also believe the potential is great. Some of the ways that I've heard this is that we have community members that have come to us saying that we want a particular school for our students. And let me tell you how this plays out. A number of years, a couple of years ago, we had to close six schools in our district and impact 11 schools total by merging them. So out of that came the opportunity for us to look for new ways to engage our community. And one of the communities that came forward was our Somali community, a large language culture in our district who in many ways feel underserved in their school communities for a number of reasons. So we said, let's put together a task force. Let's bring together people from the community, staff, leaders, to talk about what can be done about creating either a Somali language class, a series of classes, or a school for Somali students and families. So in April, the presentation was given to me, and it was pretty clear uh, that this community group was asking for um, an East African magnet school in our school district, of which we had none. In fact, there are none in the country. And it was because of this group coming together and having uh, the support of district leadership, having the support of our board, that they recommended opening this school in the fall. So last April, we decided to open up East African Elementary Magnet School in our school district. Um, there are 200, uh, over 200 students enrolled in the school. There's a waiting list for pre-K, and we've expanded it to sixth grade. And what I can share with you is that when we've come together to celebrate these accomplishments, when you can see the pride in someone's face about being seen and heard and valued, and then even more importantly, sit down and have a conversation about what it means to be either new to this country or a refugee who has a child born in this country, and to see um, to see them feel valued in their school community, it really means the world. And this has been a, a real pride point of our school district for some time. And I think the real test of equity is do we always do what we've always done, or are we looking for new ways to engage uh, with either new demands or new challenges or new opportunities in this case of saying this is the community that we want to ensure that we uh, see and value. In addition to that, there is a the largest group of newcomer students in, in my current district are Karenis, and this is the former Burma uh, country where students have come from with their, with their families. Um, not a written language, you can't go and find a bunch of vendor materials to teach students current. So we've had to create a lot of curriculum. Our incredible staff have had to create a lot of, of great curriculum. And our current students too, want, and families want a, a language, a course taught in, in their language. So we're working on that right now. And again, when we bring the community together, ask them what their needs are, ask them how they can partner with us. Amazing things happen for, uh, for children. And I think those are our two examples uh, right there where five years ago, if you would have told me we would have been working in these ways, I don't, I don't know that I would have thought of that, but it was really the community, students, and community partners coming forward and saying, this is important, this is important to our community. And um, I feel good about where we are, but the real hard work is ahead as well in terms of sustaining these excellent efforts. How would you balance the learning needs of student groups such as students with disabilities to English, English language learners? Working with the district to ensure the diverse needs of all students. Special, thank you. Wonderful question. I think first, ensuring that I know what those student needs are. You know, <laughs> MMSD is a district that I will do 53 schools now, if I have it right, but the new elementary school I drove by on my way here. 
you know, I knew an MSD uh, back in 2012. I knew an MSD from being a student and working in it for 18 years in a variety of different positions. And it's important for me to acknowledge the past and the history. But I believe the most important part of being the new superintendent here is to embrace who we are right now. In fact, that's, that's part one of the most important thing, embracing who we are right now, but also creating that future together. And that has to be done understanding what unique individual needs are of students, uh, of school communities, and making sure that, that I can support that and find support for that. I think sometimes central office leadership gets in the habit of one size fits all. I mean, that's how school districts are created. There's a central office that makes decisions, seeks permission or authority or recommendations from approval from the Board of Education, and then policies or practices are implemented. And while it's really important for a number of things from keeping the lights on in buildings like this, um, it doesn't always take into account the individual needs that, that students might have, or even more than that, the desires uh, that you have. I know that the high schools in particular have undergone you know, millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars in renovations. And I know it's probably been messy for you all, uh, but I can tell you as someone who's been in every one of the high schools, I'm excited to see what kind of possibilities are lie there. This could be new partnerships. This could be new classes where community comes in and, and is able to provide some industry experience that, that truly provides students a, a new way to look at learning application. It could lead to a different career pathway. It could lead to something that an idea that you have uh, that you might want to do after high school that you would never thought of because of that. So I think those opportunities are, are important. The other thing is that our school communities aren't made of the same fixed students each and every year. Students change, their needs change with them, and there are times where we are not always able to be nimble enough with staff. So what I mean by that is that a school could look very different for five years and get an entirely new, different student population that would require more different resources, or it may not require the same resources that it did the previous five years. This becomes difficult. Uh, when you have to move staff around, I'm certainly not advocating for itinerant staff where they're bouncing all over the district, but I know many do that. Uh, we do have very, in some cases, limited resources. So I have to make sure, our team has to make sure that we are maximizing the resources we have with the students who need them most. So keep an accurate track of what students' needs are, what schools they're at, ensuring that they have proper support is, is incredibly important. And I heard advanced learning brought up in this conversation, and I do think it's important that we establish universal high expectations for all students. But it is the easiest thing for me to say that, but if I'm not providing support for that as well, we know what kind of historical um, marginalization that, that could lead to. That if, that if we're opening the doors for students to enroll or participate, but we're not supporting students to be successful, we know what this pattern could in fact, create in our school district as well. Uh, our students are frustrated, they're not supported, um, they feel less than in the experience that they're gaining. So it has to be truly a holistic plan to support students, uh, whatever needs are meeting students where they're at, and ensuring that we have adequate support for them to be successful. I'll end with this. School districts exist for one reason and one reason only. And I know if I ask this room right here, you know, we'd probably get 20 different answers. School districts exist for you all, our students, to receive excellent education and achieve outcomes that are going to help you prepare for the future. That's why school districts exist. The LMSD website states that we believe that resources are critical to education and we are responsible for their equity and effective use. As of 2022-2023 school year, in the four-year high school plan, the district has a graduation rate of 93% when it comes to neurotypical and able-bodied students, but only a 63% graduation rate when it comes to disabled students or students with IEPs. Given that the district's belief says that all resources, such as IEPs, battle floors, adaptive curriculum, building accessibility, et cetera, are critical for an effective and equitable education. How do you plan to improve that graduation rate as well as enforce disability and accessibility protocols? Thank you, Ariad. A wonderful question. And, um, you know, I want to share with you that 
and spending so much of my faith in MMSD, a lot of my core beliefs around special education and inclusion come from being a student from kindergarten on in the school district. Um, they really do. My first memory of inclusion comes from being an elementary student at Albion Elementary School, um, where there were different able students that were present every day in my schooling experience. And, you know, and some folks might take that for granted, but when you go to a different state, different districts, different systems, that's not everybody's experience. It really isn't. So it's something that has always drawn to me. I've talked about my experiences in MMSD numerous times to, to new colleagues, um, you know, in, in Minnesota and around the country. So, so I think this, first and foremost, we need to determine if it is a resource. I mean, resources are one thing. You first have to identify what are the core issues, what, what are the barriers to students being successful? Because I would argue that there have been times saying this is happening in MSD, but I've been in education long enough to know that we resource things that either aren't working for students or sometimes even worse, we don't know if they are. And when that's the case, we can't be strategic about resources. You all know because you've heard it that we don't have unlimited uh, revenue. We don't have unlimited money to draw from, resources to draw from, to provide you an excellent education. We, we don't. Um, in fact, the, the revenue that schools get is not keeping up with the amount that it costs. I mean, it just isn't. And it hasn't for some time in Wisconsin, 10, 15 years probably. So we've got to make sure that we are identifying barriers to students being successful. We've got to bring together and convene groups that can articulate recommendations. And it might not be if 10 recommendations are created, we might not be able to implement all 10, but we might be able to say, you know what, collaboratively together as a community or at this school, this is the recommendation that we are going to implement. We have support from the district. We have a commitment to come back and do progress monitoring to ensure that it's working. And we also have the ability to stop if it's not or to resource it greater if we're seeing success. Now, that might sound really simple, but in the cycle of a school year, the cycle of a school career for a student, that isn't happening all the time. And it's for a number of reasons, whether it's law change or staff changes or superintendent change or resource changes. School districts are dynamic, volatility dynamic at times. And I think this is one way to de demonstrate that there is a way, there is a method for us to come together uh, to put the needs of students at the forefront, develop recommendations that are specific to improve that graduation rate. In addition to, there might also be alternative ways through individual education plans uh, to identify um, how students can maximize their, their legal time in, our, in MMSD to ensure they have a plan for after high school. Uh, so the graduation um, rate is really important. I'm assuming this is a four-year rate or a completion in four-year rate, but there are other alternatives to graduation as well that I want to make sure that we're getting attention to. So yes, that 63% is important, but there are other alternative pathways for graduation that are important to um, especially serving our students who receive specialized services. diverse place with a lot of news opinions. From your experience as a leader, can you share a time when you were faced with a hard ethical decision with pressure from multiple sides? How did you navigate the situation? What was the outcome? Looking back, would you have done anything differently? Thank you, Megan. Uh, great, great question. And I referenced a little bit earlier that, I mean, if you talk to any superintendent in the country, the, some of the things that they don't want to hear are school start time changes or Closing schools, those are those are really big community decisions that are many times met with um, with incredible opposition. So I shared with you that we went through a process. It's called Envision SPPS, where we were just you know, we had too many elementary schools that were under enrolled, and the resources that it required to offer a well-rounded education were not there. So we based our research and we based our implementation plan on uh, providing a, a well-rounded education for all students. Now, I did give our team a very specific directive. I said that I do not want this to impact more than 10% of our overall enrollment, and I want it to be demographically distributed as our, the students who are impacted as our entire district. 
We met those objectives, but we still didn't meet the objectives of families and students and staff who called that school their school. We, we didn't. And the lesson that I had to learn in this, get to the lesson part, is that I thought on paper, and I thought my research, and I thought my stakeholder engagement, and I thought we had down every I and crossed every T. You know, that there wouldn't be this need to hear from a community in a, in a much more deliberate and personal way. And I learned in that process because we had to call a time out, if you will, and we had to schedule a series of public forums. And I think we have three of them. Uh, they weren't time bound. It wasn't on a board meeting night, so it was just a public forum for the purpose of how do you feel about the proposed changes. Um, and it was important to hear from the community. And there was a, a modification to the ultimate recommendation, uh, but the board still went through and supported our recommendation to do this work. Now, I will say through a lot of, of real struggle, I do believe that it's been a positive development for us. I mentioned the East African Elementary Magnet School, that school's in the building that we had to close. So we have looked at opportunities for us to innovate and to and, uh, encourage and, and to continue drive enrollment into our school district. I know it's something that has, you know, Madison's MMSD's role has been stable somewhat throughout the years, but it's it's concerning. Uh, when you look at the three-year rolling average that our state funding is generated from, there is going to be the need for us to be innovative together. And I have a lot of ideas, but my ideas don't mean anything if they're not also met with how the community receives them and if they're not informed by the community's ideas as well. And what, is, what does innovation mean when it comes to you know, pre-K through 12 students and plus in, in MMSD? So I think this is a great opportunity for us to learn um, together. And you know, I can share some of the challenges that I've had in the past when it comes to making hard decisions around resources. Your experience with similar climate and mission events and implementation, and how you will apply this material to ensure MMSD achieves their sustainability. Great, thank you. Uh, I did hear some of the operations media, I think it was the 22nd, so I, I, I hear where, this, where some of the student voices are coming from. I think it's it's incredible work. Now, you, know, you all are, are born into a very different world today than I was. I remember when we first started sending me aluminum cans, for example, right? I mean, so to think about where we've come as a community where that was a big deal. I was a little bit younger than you. We're now in my current district. We have our first geothermal school. Uh, we're building a brand new elementary school that's going to use geo-exchange, which is actually pretty cool. There's a natural aquifer under the ground. So it's just going so to use aquifer. that natural aquifer to heat and cool the building. Um, we'll be the first school in Minnesota to have that. And, you know, these are just a few ways of, of how the climate work and climate justice is going to really revolutionize the, the future for students. And the cool part about it is everywhere I look, students are really leading this. Um, I took a student with me to a conference in October in San Diego, and there was a national student panel that she participated on, and I got to hear students from all different parts of the country talk about this topic and how engaged they are and how uh, they're demanding change. So I think it's going to be important for us to meet together so that we can manage expectations. I mean, there are some constraints to this work. I mean, it, you know, you can't put solar panels on every rooftop for a number of reasons. Um, electric buses. Electric buses are great. We got 10. I heard of MSCs get five, but there's an 18 month lag to get them. They cost $350,000 to make, where a, a base bus is $100,000. And there's only three places in the country that are currently manufacturing them. My point in saying this is that we're not going to be able to flip a switch, no pun intended, and, and just become 100% reliable on energy that is not impacting the earth. So it's going to take some time. I would like to work with students so we can set short, medium, and long-range goals, and we can hold each other accountable to, to meeting them. I think it's really important, and um, I really credit you for having um, a voice in this. I think that um, 
students are your age and younger, I think are going to be the future leaders of this work. And I think it would be a huge mistake if I negated that or if I you know, didn't listen to uh, your incredible ideas and if we didn't partner together. In fact, I don't need to be a leader in climate justice. You know, I may need to, I could be side by side with, with many of you and you could be the leaders in climate justice as well. I would just be the one recommending decisions to partners and Board of Education and staff to make sure that we can implement your, your ideas. Thank you so much for participating in our What questions you have in any way? Um, we enjoy learning more about you and your experiences. Um, we hope you have a great day. Thank you. Thank you all.